Okay, I need to be honest with you. This machine sucks. I don't mean the Commodore 64 in general, I just mean this machine, not a monster. This has an original 326298 Rev-A board inside. This is the first revision that Commodore put out way back in 1982 when these went on sale to the public. The problem with these is they have a pretty rubbish video output. There's only composite video and it's pretty terrible at that. There is no Chroma Luma output. Technically there is just Luma, but there's no Chroma from these machines. So it doesn't comply with either the Commodore video, which used separate Chroma and Luma, or even S-Video. So you're pretty much limited to RF or crappy composite. Well, crappy RF and crappy composite, I should say. So that's one of the things that I want to sort out today. The other one is an issue with the reset circuit. The uh, circuit in these does not play nicely with the Easy Flash 3 cartridge or the Kung Fu Flash or the Backbit cartridges. And that's just down to a little minor bodge that Commodore did when they first released this board. So I'm going to sort that out as well. And one of the voltage regulators also gets quite toasty. So we'll take a look at that too. So today we're going to sort out the issue with this machine and I'm going to do it in a way that is going to be as least invasive as possible and I'll show how we can keep this original 5-pin video port and still get chroma and luma output from this machine. Let's do it. Oh, did I mention it's an NTSC machine? Yeah, that big old sticker on the back there just randomly slapped up there and a big empty space here. It's um, quite different from what I'm used to seeing with the power machines where they just have the original sticker there and not this FCC junk. Right, and looking on the inside, yes, there is an ARM SID in there. The original SID had died in this board, which isn't a big surprise for these very old machines. There's also a change to this voltage regulator. I have already replaced it. The original one looks like this, and it normally sits just over here on this pissy little heatsink. Now, I checked this with the thermal cam after about two minutes of power on. This had already hit 70 degrees Celsius. So what I decided to do was move the voltage regulator to use this cartridge shield as a heat sink. This now gets to about 50 degrees after an hour of being powered on. And if there's a cartridge in there, I saw that hit about 45 degrees, which shouldn't be too much to melt anything. So that's perfectly fine. And it's a lot better than having this hit 70 degrees after two minutes. I don't know what it would have got up to after an hour, but I imagine it would have been even higher than that. So um, that's the little modification that I did there. If you're planning on doing the same, you just want to make sure this screw is as far back as possible. Otherwise, it's going to foul the um, cartridge shell when you insert it into the machine there. That's the only modification that I've done so far. I just ran wires to the original holes on the board here for the voltage regulator. I did also think about mounting this to the VIC-2 can. I know that Dr. Dave uh, did a similar mod where he actually put a metal strip here. Uh, and I think there's a Pulp Fiction reference on that. And uh, I thought about that, but I don't want it to get in the way every time I want to open this VIC-2 can. This mod was more like one that I saw on Adrian's Digital Basement. He had a machine that had a very similar mod where the voltage regulator was stuck to the cartridge shield, and it seemed like a good idea, so I copied it from there. Let's take a look at the video output on this machine, and then we'll try and tune that up, and also get Chroma and Luma, or S-Video, out of this thing. Of course, if you have one of the later board revisions, you're in luck thanks to our channel sponsor, PCBWay. Here you can find my RF replacement for both the longboard Commodore 64s and the shortboard Commodore 64s and 128s. There's also a huge amount of shared projects in their shared projects section, so be sure to check that out next time you head on to PCBWay. Do it. Do it now. Now because this machine uses a 5-pin DIN rather than the more common 8-pin that we have on the rest of the Commodore 64 models, I'm going to be using this cable. This was actually for an Atari 8-bit computer. I think I used it for my Atari 65XE down there. And it pretty much shares the same audio and composite video output. The only difference is this S-Video connector is not going to work, at least not at this stage. So we can still use this for composite video. If you don't have one of the 5-pin video cables, I guess you can build your own. There's plenty of links online on how to do it. All right, let's just power this machine on with the original composite video output. I haven't made any modifications. And as you can see, the image quality is 
pretty rubbish. Uh, there's a lot of noise in there, some vertical jail bars by the looks of it. So yeah, composite video out of this particular board isn't fantastic. Luckily we can fix that. And what we want to focus on is this resistor here at R10. This is a 300 ohm resistor, but you'll notice on the schematics for this board, there's 120 ohms listed. So I don't know what happened here, but for whatever reason, 300 ohms got put in the board, whereas the schematic says 120, and 120 actually gives you a better video output. So let's fix that up. Let's just take a quick look at what the video output looks like on an oscilloscope before we make any changes. It's pretty normal for a composite video signal. It looks fairly standard, but the voltage level is only around 460 millivolts peak to peak. That should be up around one volt for a standard composite video signal. I've also changed the border colors on the Commodore 64 to white, so that's why you're seeing those two sort of larger peaks at either end. But yeah, that voltage level isn't ideal. So if we go by the schematics and put a 120 ohm resistor in there, that should bring our voltage level back into spec. I don't know why there's a 300 in here. It doesn't seem to make any sense. It's just Commodore being Commodore, I guess. Now there are two ways to do this. You can either piggyback a 180 ohm resistor over the top of this 300 ohm resistor, or you can replace the whole thing with the proper 120 ohm. I'm gonna do the latter and pull the board out because we're gonna make a couple of other changes. So I'm gonna need access to the underside of the board anyway. So our resistor should be this one just here. Holding on, desperate not to leave. Right, so with the 300 ohm out from R10, we're gonna put in a 120 ohm. Right, resistor's in place. Let's check out this video output again. Now you'll notice that it was quite bright at first and that's because the RetroTink is auto-adjusting to that new video output level, which should be closer to spec now. Um, most displays will automatically adjust themselves to get roughly the right video output level, but you'll lose contrast and potentially introduce more noise when the video output level is incorrect. So this looks a lot better. Let's grab a little screenshot. So I think overall the image looks a lot better. There's still some faint vertical jail bars, but it's certainly not as noisy as it was before. It might be a little bit more color fringing, but that's a small price to pay for a cleaner video output in my opinion. I don't really plan on doing any major changes to this board, so I'm not gonna scope out the whole video circuitry. I'm just doing simple little tweaks that have the biggest impact. Let's just change the border color to white so we've got the maximum sort of variance in brightness. And let's see what it looks like on the oscilloscope now. All right, so we're now seeing a peak to peak value of around 960, 970 millivolts. So that sorts out the composite video. What about getting Chroma and Luma or S video out of this thing? Let's just take a look because this machine does output Luma, it just doesn't output the Chroma signal. So we can have a black and white image, but not a color one. So there we go, we have a pretty sharp image, but it's only black and white. Now the Luma signal in this machine also has voltage issues. It's not too low, it's actually way too high. Let's take a look on the scope to see what it's up to at the moment. And just change that border color to white again. So looking back on the scope, we can find our Luma output over here on the DIN connector. It's probably the easiest place to probe it from. And we're seeing close to two volts peak to peak. So it is actually double what the spec should be. So uh, we're gonna have to reduce that rather than increase it like we did for the composite video. Now you may be wondering why I don't just throw one of my replacement RF modulators in this machine. And the reason for that is because this is literally just an RF modulator. It's not doing any of the amplification of the video circuit unlike all the other Commodore 64 boards. So the only signals that go into here are the ones that get put out over RF. Making changes to this thing will do absolutely nothing for the composite or S-video signals. That's probably why this Vic can is a lot bigger than all the other boards as well, because all the amplification is happening in here rather than in here. So again, we're going to swap out one of the resistors. It's this one above the one that we just replaced. So R9, there's a 75 ohm in there. We're going to replace that with 220 ohm, and that should bring the Luma level back down to the correct spec. All right, that one is out, and here's our 220 ohm replacement. 
All right, I'm just going to change the border color to white again. Hopefully that should have done it. Can't actually see what I'm doing at the moment. Let's see what it looks like on the scope though. Cool, there we go. 973, 981 millivolts. So perfectly within spec. Let's swap over to the capture device, see what it looks like there. Cool, there we go. It may actually look slightly better than it did before, but we've still got no color. So not really a big deal, but definitely want to get those video levels in spec before we go any further. Now let's talk about what's on this actual video connector at the moment. There's audio in, audio out, composite video, luma out, and ground. One thing we don't need out of those is the audio in pin. There's pretty much nothing that uses the audio in on the SID chip, and I don't even know if the ARM SID supports the audio in, so we can get rid of that and replace it with chroma. The bonus with that is that matches what the Atari video output connector is like. All we need to do is make a couple of changes to the board to swap the audio in to a chroma out. First thing we're going to do is remove this capacitor right here at C12. Right, so with this capacitor removed from C12, we're now going to route chroma from over here into the negative side of this cap. So that's the leftmost side. If you put chroma in the right side, that's going to go to the audio in on the SID. The SID's probably not going to like that. So make sure it's on the left. And we're going to grab it from this capacitor over here, C79. So this capacitor actually mixes everything to give us our composite video signal. So we want to grab our chroma before it gets mixed in with all the other crap. So right-hand side of that cap is going to go to left-hand side of C12. But we also need to put in a 390 ohm resistor because the chroma level is a little bit too hot for the 300 millivolt S video spec. So a bit of wire and a 390 ohm resistor, but I'm going to do all this from the underside of the board. So the left leg of the capacitor should be this point right here. We don't want to remove it, we just want to put a bit of solder on there so we can solder our wire to it. I'm going to stick our 390 ohm resistor in the left hole where the capacitor was and just solder that into place. And then these two are just going to meet in the middle. Of course, a bit of heat shrink to keep everything neat. Cool, that's the modification done. I'll just cover this up so we don't short to anything. Better trim off the rest of that resistor leg that's now sticking up through the board. Okay, so we now have a wire going from the right leg of this capacitor through a 390 ohm resistor up to this point at C12. We should now have a proper in-spec S-video output from this machine, so let's give it a try. Oh yes, look at that. That looks fantastic. Let's just have a quick look at the voltage levels there. And we're seeing almost spot on 300 millivolts peak to peak, so that is perfect for S video. So now we have a pretty decent composite video output and also a very nice S video output from this original Rev A board. Didn't have to cut any traces, we literally just added three resistors, and it's all reversible. You can always put this back to how it was before. I'm pretty happy with that. The only thing left to do is sort out this reset signal so I can use it with my Easy Flash 3 cartridge. Just to give you an idea of what happens with the Easy Flash, you can see that it boots up okay, and damn, that picture looks good. But if I try and select something, it just does that. That also happens with any other cartridge that tries to reset the machine. What's happening here is the cartridge is trying to pull the reset line low, but the board is actually fighting it. So it tries to reset, but ends up being stuck in a weird state. There is a fix for that as well though, and this one I actually found on the Lemon64 forums. Uh, so I'll put a link to that in the video description, but it's quite a simple one. All we need to do is put a resistor in R36, which Commodore actually had a place for, but never ended up using it, and snip a leg on this 556 timer. For whatever reason, Commodore ended up doing the reset circuit this way, but it looks like they had originally planned to use R36 for the reset circuit and then bodged something up somewhere, so we're going to fix that little mistake. Just clear out the holes of R36. Throw in our 1K resistor, and where's my solder? 
And then we just need to snip pin nine of this 556. So I'm gonna do this from the top side because we need to leave that factory bodge wire in place. And that should be that pin snipped. We'll just do a quick continuity check. So we shouldn't have anything from the pin itself to the pad underneath. Oh, 3.7 mega ohms. So yep, that's perfectly fine. That's gonna be flowing back through that chip somewhere. So that's it. Uh, if you're worried about cutting legs on ICs, it's a 556 timer. It's not like we're cutting up a CPU or a VIC or something. All right, let's pop the easy flash cartridge back in and see if it works properly. All right, that looks good. So let's try and go into one of these menus. Aha, much better. So there we go. This should all be working now. We can jump into the diagnostic if we want. Cool. So that is a fix for the Easy Flash 3 and also, as I mentioned, the back bit and the Kung Fu Flash. There's probably others that rely on a similar sort of technique to make all this menu magic work. But yeah, it seems to work just fine now. Let's even jump back into basics, see if it'll do that. Yep, that's good. Back to the menu. That looks good. Cool. Let's try a different kernel. And yep, that also works. So yep, all good there. Let's close up this machine and I think we can call this one done. All right, that's it with just four resistors and a bit of careful planning. This machine has gone from something that, to be honest, I've avoided using to something that I'm looking forward to trying out. So um, I'm going to fire up some games and try them out at the proper NTSC speeds rather than the slow down PAL speeds, see what they're like. Obviously, a lot of demos won't work because all the best ones were coded for PAL machines, but uh, we can live with that. I'm not going to be using this full time, but I am kind of keen to see what an NTSC machine is like for reals. So I hope you've enjoyed this one. If you've got a 326298 board, definitely consider doing some of these mods if you haven't done mods to it already. Um, I think it's certainly worth it and makes this machine a far better one up there with the rest of the Commodore 64 revisions. So um, that's it for me. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe and also share this video around if you think anyone else would be interested in seeing it. Uh, a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same, links to that are down below. You'll get ad-free early access to videos and also allow me to continue researching these kind of things and hopefully bring them to you. So um, yeah, thank you all for watching and I will catch you in the next one. Bye. Another All right, visitor. let's do this. Stay a while. Stay forever. Oh. Yeah, that's quite a bit faster. All right, this is going to be a challenge. I'm also only capturing this at 25 frames per second, so it is also quite jittery. Fine. Ah! Doing well.